Glad to have you all here this morning. Here we are in February. So this year is just like last. January evaporates. It's going to be April before you know it. Let's see, Sunday, Sunday school after morning worship. Ladies meeting Friday, February 16th, which is closer than you think. Food pantry month is this month. So you know what we do is uh, we uh, support the Monteo Con uh, Country Club. <laughs> <laughs> the Monteo Methodist Church. And uh, they have a food pantry up there. And you remember once a year we like to stock them up as much as we can. And so they appreciate it and uh, it's a good deal. So if you've got canned goods, you know, stuff like uh, instant macaroni and cheese, uh, pasta, stuff that's readily makeable. Um, bring it on in in your cans, vegetables, whatever, and put it on the table back there. Let's see here. Lisa. Happy birthday tomorrow. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Dan, tomorrow. Happy birthday. To which one? Dan's birthday tomorrow, right? Happy birthday, Dan. <laughs> all the greats. Henry Aaron, the all-time home run hitter. Babe Ruth's day after. Need I say more? Anybody else? Who's ready for the Super Bowl? How many people want San Francisco? No, Barb, the Eagles are not in it. I know. <laughs> but I'm really not interested in these two teams. <clears throat> I mean, the Chiefs, I really do care for them. But after Taylor Swift got in there, it just turned me right off. <laughs> Watch the puppy bowl. All right, so how many people want Kansas City? Raise your hand. Who's watching it? How many people want San Francisco? Raise your hand. What is it there? <laughs> how many people are pretty indifferent? <laughs> <laughs> because Joe Montana's wife's so pretty? Well, she's from the area. That's what I would go for. Yeah, then. she's from the area. So. <laughs> um, San Francisco. Better uniforms. That's got to be it. Okay, anybody else? All right, great to have everybody here today. Boy, I'll tell you, you know, the sun's coming up earlier. And, uh, and once the sun comes up, it changes everything. Look at this, February 4th, and we're thinking like we're out of the woods, you know. Uh, we'll see what happens, right? Let's turn in our hymnals to number 35. <laughs> Let's all stand as we sing. <laughs>
And the men will read the first lines, the women will read the italicized. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my past and my lying down. And are acquainted with all my ways. Even before the world was on my tongue. O Lord, you know, know it completely. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. For wonderful are your works, and I know them very well. well. My praise is not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes have beheld my inmost substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when, when none of them would have existed. Yeah. existed. A mighty to me, on your thoughts, O God. Thank you. May be seated. Bow our heads, we have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. And for the privilege of being a part of your kingdom. Lord, as if being wasn't enough. The fact that you included us in this magnificent creation. And not just included us, but you've made us in your image. So that we share a likeness with you some magnificent ways. We've been made in a way that we could fellowship with God who's created the heavens and the earth. The rocks cry out. The trees applaud you. The heavens and the earth declare and sing your glory every day. But only mankind can experience this intimacy with the beloved God of the creation. Father, we thank you for that. And if that wasn't enough, you have sent your Son that we might never ever be separated from you, that we might justly be forgiven, that we might justly be included in your family, that we might be made holy, found blameless in the eyes of God himself, the eternal judge of all creation, having paid the price for our sin, justified us, that we might be found pure, holy, acceptable in heaven itself. Father, we ought to worship you forever just for that, and we do. We're so grateful also, Father, that you have not only made us to know you as our Savior, as our Creator, as our God, and as our Lord, but you tell us you're our friend. And our Heavenly Father, we gather around you today and we bring our friends before you. We trust many of them are your friends as well. We ask you to put your healing hand upon these folk. There are people down here, Lord, who are going through terrible issues and terrible difficulties and uh, putting up a fight. And we ask you to continue to put your hand upon each and every one. We ask you to bring comfort and peace to those who have lost loved ones in recent days. We ask you to bring courage and vision and wisdom and light to those who stand with their families. Watch over each and every one. We ask you, our Heavenly Father, for physical healing for those who have undergone surgery. And we're thankful for the many great reports we've had lately. And our Heavenly Father, for those who anticipate surgery or treatments or different uh, procedures that you know we could never take for granted down here in this world but we ask you for courage for patience for faith and for a great result our heavenly father we're praying for our friends over there in taylor and our friend dale morell our heavenly father we're thankful for the faithfulness and courage he and his wife have shown we ask you to continue to bless them and watch over them, our Heavenly Father. The world might not be interested. 
The world might not see this as a great success story, but boy, you do. And we ask you to put your hand continually upon Dale and his, and this flock over there in Taylor. Bless them and use them for your glory. Lord, deliver us from the day where we despise small things. For the smallest mustard seed in your hand become a mighty, mighty tree. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with him, Pam and Jose Munoz in Guatemala. And we're so grateful for the privilege of sharing in that work that's taken place and flourished so wonderfully down there. We ask your blessing to continue to be upon them. We also pray for our friend Ray Compton and our Heavenly Father once again for our uh, evening cafe. That's why he's a part of this family right here. That's why we have communication and fellowship with him. Uh, he asked us to pet Murphy on the head. And Father, we're glad that he's a part of our family right here and we ask your blessing upon him. We pray that you fill his heart with your Holy Spirit and he might have deep and powerful sense within his soul that the God of heaven and earth loves him. We think of Anne Marie and her faithfulness and selflessness and just a, I mean, the hand of God down here among us. She and her breed who give up their own privileges and their own opportunities and their own Really, in, in many ways, they give up their own life to take care of people around them who need it. We ask your deepest and richest blessing upon them. Those that work in nursing homes, those that work in care facilities, they work in hospitals, they work in places where they rehab and bring hope and encouragement and, and help people <laughs> regain a, a better quality of life. We ask your blessing on every last one of them. Our Heavenly Father, we can pray all day. There are so many things that are worthy of our prayers. The United States Armed Forces, there is law enforcement agencies up and, and agents up and down the line. There are border patrol. There are prison guards. There are first responders. The fire department. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for those in our community. I mean, we're just reminded of Joe Fugas passing at... Uh, the faithfulness and service of these volunteer firemen in and around our community, the first responders and everybody else who makes this a great world to live in, in spite of this curse. Father, thank you for each and every one. Again, we could pray all day. We're going to limit our prayers to those and ask you to hear our prayers as we say together, Our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> I think it's time for Debbie Ritter to pick a hymn. Great to have Dick and Ginger with us today. Always a pleasure. Met Mr. Muleheisen over at the Methodist Church years ago and uh, we spoke at a Seven Words of Christ, and uh, I used to carry a Bible in my boot, yeah. and I really thought that was great. <laughs> what do you got, Deb? 419. 419. That's a good one. <coughs> You can remain seated. <laughs>
favorite hymn? No. No. <laughs> Why did you pick it? Just because that's something we used to sing with Dad. <laughs> because as soon as you pick that hymn, I, I, you know, we don't sing that one all the time here, no. which is fine. No. But as soon as I saw it and started singing, I thought, wow, this is so much like Debbie. Yeah. Now that you're Jesus. No, but Dad used to pick that all the time to sing when he did. Yeah, if that, if that was your lifetime theme song, that would work. Yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great thing. All right, folks. Look around the room. Tell these people how glad you are they're here today. We're glad you're here, Dale. Joyce. Look how big he's getting. Oh, he's getting big. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Wow. He's six months already. Yeah, he is getting. It's hard to believe how big he is. Yes. No matter what age. <coughs> I don't have any nice ones. I couldn't. I had to put it under. I still um, need it. Oh, Destiny is going to be 25. Is she? Is she? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, when is she going to be 25? In June. In June? Oh, no, okay. What day? 14th. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for the stay and the blessings of it. You are so good. Thank you so much for not just staying in heaven. You could do that. I mean, you're the God of creation. There's no reason for you to come down here and bother with us or include us. I mean, you could just make us like a snow globe and shake it up every once in a while or even forget all about it or throw it in the trash or whatever. But you've made yourself known to us as so much more than that. And I mean it makes life worth living, Lord. If we didn't have you, we would not have anything. We wouldn't be anything. We wouldn't exist. But to know that the God of heaven and earth says, you know what, I call you my friend. When you said, you know, I call you my friends, and talking to people like Peter who denied you three times when you in worldly terms, might have needed it the most, his support. <clears throat> you looked at Doubting Thomas and said, you know what, you're my friend. Looked at John, when I called out fire from heaven on people who would be, you know, an annoyance in his life. And you said, this is one of my friends. And John went to his grave saying that you're, he is the disciple that you loved. Well, our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for calling this motley crew together and calling them apostles. Because you speak to us through them. And you call us through them. And you tell us we're friends through them. We'll thank you forever for that. Would you reveal yourself to us here this morning? I mean, pull the, pull the curtain away and show us your glory just like you did to that man who was really uh, a murderer who took off and hid in the dark side of the desert for 40 years, cavorting among goats and sheep. But the creator of all eternity went and visited that man at 80 years old and said, I got something for you. You think this bush is on fire? I'm going to set your heart on fire. Lord, come to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We started this block of scripture here in our bulletin where uh, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and they said, you know what? Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees' disciples and we we fast all the time. And your disciples, they're not fasting, they're, they're having a party. You're sitting over here at the house with Matthew the tax collector, who everybody in our town thinks is a traitor and he's a backstabber, he's a sneaky man. He's made his wealth taking advantage of us. And the next thing you know, we see you sitting at the table with him, tax collectors and sinners. 
Jesus, how, how do you explain this? And he said, you know what? You can't fast during the wedding celebration and the bridegroom is here. I am in your presence. And these people, it's a time for rejoicing. The time will come when there will be sorrow. The time will come for difficulty. The time will come for hardships to be endured and worked through. But it's not now. I am here, in other words. And you're going to have to realize that your fasting and your method of religion, it doesn't cut it. Because it's got to come from the heart. See, you can't put old wine in these new wineskins. And I am taking the law, which had its place, and was given at a certain time, and it's a part of the revelation of God to the whole world. Okay? The justice of God has been made known in the law. And what the law has done to us has condemned us. But I've come to seek and to save the lost. That's why I'm sitting at the table with Matthew and his tax collector friends that everybody hates. That's why I'm sitting at the table with all these sinners who you condemn and I think are beneath you and they have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. But I came to embrace those very people. No, it's a new era. It's a time of forgiveness. It's a time to highlight mercy. It's a time to highlight grace. You know what grace is? You know, they say it's un the, the, the official definition that they always say. Grace is unmerited favor, right? Grace is what God looked at and saw in Noah. He saw a whole world circling around in a dissension into sin, and he saw Noah. And the Bible doesn't say he saw Noah and saw a sinless man. The Bible says he saw Noah and he had favor for him, grace for him, okay? Almost as if to say, this is the teacher's pet right here, this Noah right here. And somebody said, why in the world would God do that? That's not fair, that's not right. You can't have a teacher's pet. You can't. Don't, don't teachers have pets? They do, right? Joseph, Jacob in the Bible, they had favorite sons. He bought Joseph a coat of many colors. No, it's a reality, and we understand it. And God looked at it, and Noah, and he says, you know what? You're my favorite right now. We're going to reveal my grace to the whole world through you and your family. Grace and favor, it's a spirit, it's an attitude of Generosity. That's what we get from God. <clears throat> to the spirit of generosity. That's what Jesus came. The law, the Torah, the teaching, it came through Moses. But grace, this generous spirit that wants to give, and truth came through <clears throat> Christ Jesus. What a great thing. No, it's time for new wineskins for this new wine, this fresh spiritual experience. And while he was saying these things, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him. Remember we talked about the leader of the synagogue? He's a part of the establishment. They were telling people, you know what? If you, they went to that blind man who Jesus gave him back his sight. They said to his parents, is this your, really your son? Or is this somebody who just looks like your son? Because we don't believe that Jesus could really give sight to the blind. There is a trick here. This is like that lady, you know, in Pittsburgh who gets healed and throws her crutches on the stage and dances through the aisle. And she's been healed and set free. And then three nights later, the same lady in Cleveland throws her crutches on the floor and dances through the aisle up there because she's been set free again. And the whole world looks at it and says, what a fake, what a farce, what a fraud, just what I thought. And so they came to the parents of this blind man and said, tell us the truth, come on. 
We know he's not your son. Why don't you ask him? They were afraid to say he was healed by Jesus because if they did, they'd get thrown out of the synagogue. Well, this synagogue leader, he doesn't care if they throw him out. He doesn't care if they get together and say, do you know what? Our leader went down and he's talking about Jesus. He's talking to Jesus. He's cavorting with Jesus. He doesn't care about that because he cares about his daughter more than appearance. And so he goes and says, you know what? My daughter's died, but come and lay your hand on her and she'll live. Jesus got up and went and followed him with his disciples. While he's doing that, suddenly a woman who'd been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. We talked about that. She's unclean. This is a, this is a powerful thing. I uh, get to sit in on these face-to-face uh, -face missionary calls. And yesterday, uh, we, we pray for Helen and Lauren Anderson here all the time, right? Remember, they're missionaries of the week, frequently, routinely. <clears throat> And uh, they're over in Spain. And Helen Anderson has gotten this burden on her heart for the people called the Maasai. And they're down in Africa, I think Tanzania. Y'all know where Tanzania is, right? Just, just to the left of Tunkhannock. <laughs> it's the Tanzanian area, I guess. And uh, she, she had, they had their friend with them yesterday. He's, a, he's the pastor from Marco from down there in this Tanzania area. He lives in what they call, get, get ready, the bush. I mean, it ain't the bush in Carbondale. This is the real bush. Serengeti is, I think, where it is. And they live in villages. And in those villages, everybody is in the same family. You know? I mean, it's uncles, aunts and all their grandchildren and children. It's, it's all one family, lives in one community. And uh, it's, they're all headed by witch doctors, okay? And so he's telling, he's the Spanish there telling us about this. And uh, he's describing what life is like in the community. And when somebody dies, they leave them out in the bush for the lions to get. They put the body out there for the lions to eat. I mean, they got lions, wild lions, roaming around in their area. And the lions come and they take the body away and they eat it and they think that's good. But if they put the body out there and the lions don't come and eat it, they say, uh-oh, something's wrong here. Why won't the lions eat this dead body? There's something wrong in that family. There's something being done in that family that's what they would call sin. There is some spell, there's some curse, there's something the matter, because the lions won't eat the body. And their daughters, when their daughters come of age, which is something like anywhere from 12 to 14, they do what they would call a circumcision. Okay? And uh, it involves cutting the girl's private parts. <coughs> and they have professional cutters who do this work. Oh my goodness. It's a routine part of the thing. And if you don't get your daughter cut, then she's not marketable. Nobody's going to want to marry her because they think if you don't get this cutting done, then there'll be a curse on you from God. And so the gospel message in their community is what they do is some girl, they, this, this, this group that we're working with, they rescue these girls. They rescue them 56, I think they have 56 so far this year, or uh, I mean they're rescuing girls and they've been doing it for 15 years from this. And when they do, and when a girl's 16, she marries a guy if he's 60 years old. That's what they do. And the man's 60 years old and he dies in no time flat. And she's left a widow and, well, too bad. She's <coughs> not, and the word is marketable. She's not really marketable anymore. 
Because that's the rules. That's the law. That's the culture. And he says when the gospel comes, it sets us free from the rules, from the law, from the culture. And this family gets, and he uses the word all the time about being born again. They get born again in this family. And the girl doesn't go through the cutting. And they say, this family's prosperous. This family's happy. God hasn't dropped a boulder from heaven on this family. Because that's not how God is. And it's a continual process of trying to undo superstitions. And in this community, he talks about the kingdom all the time. He says, the kingdom of God. When you're born again, you become a part of the kingdom of God. And I'm thinking, my gosh. These are the same terms that came into my life in Johnson City, New York, when I got saved. They're talking about the same Jesus who comes into your life here, who comes into our lives, who watches over us. He's the same Jesus over there. I asked the man, I says, what happens if, uh, what kind of persecution do you undergo? And he says, oh, well, you know, if they find out you're uh, born again, and if you're, they might come with, quote, their spears and their knives and their swords and kill you. So we can't go anywhere alone. We always have to go in a group. And I said, well, what would you do if you were all alone and they came to get you? He says, well, they, they, they do. They come into your house at night with their spears. And I said, would you defend yourself? Would you take a spear and defend yourself? And <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just fascinated by this whole thing. And then he says, no, you know what? He says, they've started to become afraid of me because they think I'm in communion with God. And so I have this like thing of protection. And then he said, they won't want to do things in darkness with their spears, these warriors who come to defend the culture and the community. Uh, when they come at night, they come in darkness, they can't come in the light because the government protects everybody <coughs> over there. And I thought, holy mackerel, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. He said that there is a power that God has left in this world that restrains so that lawlessness and evil and cruelty and wickedness doesn't just spread like wildfire, but it's almost kept like a pot at a simmer and God doesn't let it boil over. He has his hand upon us. He has his hand upon them. And he said about the witch doctor, which is what we're going to talk about here. The witch doctor, there was a man who was deaf and dumb in their community. Lo and behold, deaf and dumb. You know anybody that's deaf and dumb? Can't speak? Can't hear? I, I know I can't hear very well. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> Well, we read about that in the Bible, don't we? Well, they prayed for this deaf and dumb man. And he was healed before their very eyes. And the witch doctor's answer to that was, Pay attention to what I say. <laughs> did not break, Joyce. <laughs> Last time I did that, it broke. And it was... <laughs> For my next act, <laughs> let's see. The witch doctor said, Your God is stronger than my God. He's able to set that man free. And that man was cursed by my God. And now that witch doctor, like, is kind of afraid of him. And I told him, I, I got the name of the guy. S -s -s the witch doctor's name is uh, Saru. I got it in a note on my desk. We're going to start praying for witch doctors. We're, I'm not kidding you. We're going to start praying that these witch doctors <clears throat> get saved. And you know what? He says, your God is greater than mine. That's what's taking place in the Bible on every page. Okay? Hey, my daughter just died, Jesus. Would you please come? 
and see what you can do? Come and lay your hand on her and she'll live. Jesus got up and followed him. Suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I'll be made well. Remember what the other Gospels say about her? She had spent her entire life's savings. Everything she had, she'd spent on getting well. And none of it worked. She touches Jesus' cloak. And she's well. And Jesus turns and seeing her, looks at her and said, you violated the law. Woman, you're not supposed to be among men. Women are to be seen from a distance. And you're not supposed to be in with these men. That's what loose women do. Woman, you touch me? How dare you touch the priest? Do you know how holy I am? Do you know how just I am? Do you know that God chose me? You've got some nerve touching me. You know where you're headed now. When God gets a hold of you, he is not going to let go until you pay to the last penny. No, Jesus didn't say any of those things. He turned around and said, you know what power went out of me? The King James says virtue, that, that word virtue means power. What it actually means, ver, vir, a man, a man who is virulent is a manly individual. All right? This man's got, I, I felt like manly power flowing out of me. And the disciples said, how could you tell? There's a thousand people touching you. And he said, because somebody made contact with me and I felt that energy leave through me. And he turned around and here's the woman scared to death. She's broken a bunch of laws. She's in violation. She's in trouble. She got healed for not very long, but now the pumpkin, that, that carriage that brought her to the dance, it's turned into a pumpkin because it's midnight. And all of a sudden, Cinderella's beautiful clothes, they go back to what they used to be. And now she's just a hemorrhaging woman. Well, that ain't what happened. That's not the God we worship. Jesus turned around and said, take heart, daughter. <clears throat> How do you like that? First he says, take heart. Relax. Just calm down. You don't know who you're dealing with. And he calls her his daughter. Okay? He didn't call her an outcast. He didn't call her unclean. She'd been unclean for years. He called her daughter. A term of endearment. And he said, take care, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly that woman is made well and went in peace. And everybody looking on looks at that. And what do we see again and again in the Gospels? We've never seen authority like this before. This man has authority and power over even <coughs> devils. This man has authority and power over the forces of sickness. Over the forces, well, let's see. Jesus came to the leader's house. I could use a drink of water now. How do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus came, it's kind of dry in here this morning. Jesus came to the leader's house. You know, that synagogue leader who just about has emptied himself of a career. He saw the flute players, the King James says, the minstrels. They're playing and the crowd is making a commotion. I read in a commentary back in the day, one of the rabbis wrote and said, even if, you know, I mean, if you have a low level funeral, you gotta have one flute player and one professional crier. You know, they had women but Joyce used to go to a funeral, just about every funeral in town. You didn't weep, yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah I wasn't crying. Did you, did, you, did you cry? For nothing. For not for nothing. But she didn't. I, I never saw Joyce go up to the coffin and throw herself against it and burst forth in tears, screaming, "Why? How could this be? Oh God, please!" I mean, any pro would do something of that caliber, right? I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you, you don't mourn professionally if you don't have a good act, right? Well, here's the minstrels, the mourners, 
They're carrying on in there, doing their thing. And it says Jesus shows up and says they were making a commotion. And he said, go away because the girl's not dead. She's only asleep. The Bible says they laughed at him. They mocked him. They scoffed at him. Who do you think you are? Ah, we've heard about your tricks. We know what you do. This woman's dead. The girl's gone. You're not going to do anything here. Get lost. Hit the bricks. Jesus turned around and he said, no, you hit the bricks. It says when they were put out, when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand. And the Bible says the girl got up. See, to Jesus, she's just asleep. Because he's the giver of life. You know what the Gospel of John says in the first few, first few verses? Jesus is the creator. And then it says in him is life. And that life is the light of all men. Who's got life in them? Right? God takes a handful of dirt. And he breathes into it. And we are all come into being. I mean Adam. And then the separation of Adam and Eve. And then <coughs> miracle upon miracles, they come together and children start to come. And children grow up and then they have children. And they have children. And it multiplies all over the world. And here we are. And it all started when God took a handful of dirt. And the Gospel of John says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, like somebody is with their family. <clears throat> and then the, the actual Greek wording is, and God was the Word. We say the Word was God because it's better in English. But in a raw, unvarnished, unpolished translation, it says God was the Word. Everything came into being through Him. And if you didn't get that line, His next line is, and without Him nothing came into being that came into being. In other words, everything that is came into being through Christ and for Christ. And the next line is, in Him was life. And that life was the light of all men. And that light is coming into the world. Now, they put her out. They put the men out who were laughing and mocking. And Jesus spoke to the girl, and the next thing you know, that corpse, it's illuminated. It's back to life. She's up and running. I mean, a corpse. That's the word. A dead body. Charlie Vandenberg has done his work. That thing's full of formaldehyde. That's dressed up. That's got some makeup, baby. And if you touch it, it's cold. And it's lifeless. And it's almost like a wax figure. And Jesus speaks to that girl and she gets up and she's alive. And the report spread throughout the district, little wonder. There is a man who has power over life and death. And he's walking among us. And he's not withholding his hand. Jesus went from there. Two blind men followed him, crying loudly, Have mercy on us, son of David! Son of David? Yeah, Messiah! That's Messiah talk! That's Christ talk! That's King talk! The kingdom of God is at hand, John the Baptist said. And these two blind men, they can't see with these eyes, but they can see with these eyes. And they say, here's our king. We know it in our hearts. We sense it. Have mercy on us, son of David. And he entered the house. The blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, you believe I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes. And he said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. 
And after they'd gone away, a demoniac, this is like, you talk about a rapid fire, right? Assault weapon. As fast as you can pull that trigger, it shuts out a, a, a shell. Well, here's Jesus rapid firing healing. He's walking through the community and everybody who comes up to him. They came to his house one day, he was over at Peter's house. And the Bible says that they brought everybody they could think of to his door that night. They couldn't get in the house. They were swarming around the door and he is healing them all. Jesus went from there, two blind men. Have mercy on the son of David. Think I can do this? Yeah, we think you can. He touched their eyes and they said, according to your faith, be it done. And after they'd gone, a demoniac who was mute, like that guy in Africa, was brought to him, and when the demon had been cast out, the one who had been mute spoke. And the crowds were amazed. And they said, never has anything like this been seen in Israel. The crowds said, we saw a couple weeks ago that that demon-possessed man who had 2,000 demons, Jesus walked up and they immediately said, are you here to torture us before the time? Are you here to cut us time short? Well, the <coughs> demons recognized Jesus. But the Pharisees, the self-righteous religious, the people who got that straight theology, they're writing the books. And they're teaching down at the synagogue. And they're the arbiter of right or wrong. You send your letter in to Dear Abby, and then you send your letter in to Dear Pharisee. And he tells what the Bible says about that. Where do you want to know? Because he knows that Bible from cover to cover. And he's in charge of the law. You know, the law that says, we better mutilate your daughter, or else God's not going to be happy with you. And then nobody's going to want her. <coughs> now those Pharisees looked at Jesus, and their assessment was, this is the work of the devil. By the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. How could you be so blind? How could you get so used to life down here on this planet that you think there's no grace or goodness ever going to come again? These people look at Jesus, and he's healing the blind. He's healing the woman's hemorrhage, and all they see is, wait a minute, there's rules, and he just broke them. We go by rules down here. And Jesus said, you better get some new wineskins. You better get something that'll hold the Holy Spirit. Because that old wine doesn't cut it anymore. It was set for a purpose, and you know what its purpose really is? The Apostle Paul would tell us, you know why the law was given? To make sin utterly sinful. To expose sin. No signs out on our street here at Jefferson Avenue. No speed limit signs. You go down there. Helen would go down that Jefferson Avenue with 63 miles an hour. I just know she would if she could. She'd run down that 63 miles an hour and Billy Arthur would pull her over and said, hey, what do you think you're doing? You're speeding. And Helen would say, speeding what? What's the speed limit? There are no posted speed limit out there. I didn't speed. And Billy'd say, ah, she did it again. Like the road runner and the coyote, right? But then they put up the sign. Then they put up the sign and it says, what, 15? And now he pulls her over going 63 and he says, road runner, I've been waiting for this day and I got you. Because there's a law and it's posted and you broke it. And these people, all they care about is that law and they've lost sight of the God who gave the law. Jesus came that we might know who he is and what he's like. And he knows all about our violations of the law. That's why the cornerstone of his kingdom is forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Because Lord, we're just people down here in this world and we can just come and go and never know what's what, never know the score, just drift along like the rest of the world does. But you have made yourself known. You've spoken to us through these scriptures. 
You speak to us through our experiences. You speak to us through good people all around us, all over the world. You speak to us through the Holy Spirit. Our Heavenly Father, the word from heaven is, the law came through Moses. That brought condemnation. But grace, favor, generosity, forgiveness, and truth, unassailable truth, Jesus died for our sins and he's alive forevermore handing out forgiveness and saying hey anybody want to be a part of my kingdom you, you, you can get out of this kingdom this kingdom is a kingdom of death this kingdom that you read about shake your head and say wow this world is so corrupt and this world they've got these things going on in Tanzania and all over the world there's rotten things happening Oh, boy, where's God? And Jesus shows up and says, hey, you want to be a part of this kingdom down here in this world? There's no hope down here. But you come and walk with me and there's hope. And it's hope that will never, ever disappoint. Speak to us. Because according to our faith, we're going to be made whole. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn our handles to uh, 318. <clears throat>
lost and losers and down and downtrodden and said, yeah, I want it. He said, great, because I came looking for you. Thank you for all these things in Jesus' name.